Yeah, I think the one that for me stood out the most and also replicates or mirrors what I have learned about myself and all the people I've worked with over the years is that resting and not climbing quite as much, whether it's overall or just in parts of the week or the year, is an incredibly powerful tool that I think probably the majority, if not you know, 90% of climbers are not truly understanding and respecting. To, to focus on rest here first off, I think is fantastic because the power of rest has come up often, again and again and again. Alex Magos talked about, you know, you know, early 20s or late teens doing 28 days on in Bishop and this kind of thing, but then getting injured and as he's gotten older, recognize the power of rest. If you're operating at 90%, it still means that you're able to operate at a very high level and you're not down at, you know, having a 60% day where you just feel completely broken. You're, you're able to tap into kind of nine out of 10 efforts still. And I would say that's a sign of someone or, or anyone who is managing to tread that fine line between, I suppose, overreaching and overtraining. And what I mean by overreaching or the simplest term for people to understand is that overreaching, I think of as being pushing yourself on a very short scale a little harder than your body has time or ability to recover from. Consistently and continually, you're allowing yourself these intermittent recovery periods, whether it's you know your deload week or it's a three day set of days off to then recover, to then get back quite quickly into an overreaching phase. And you tend to just slowly creep forward as an athlete and get better and better from season to season in this manner. Whereas overtraining tends to be where people do that overreaching cycle but then they don't allow them to self have a deload week or a three day rest block. And then they slowly dig themselves a hole where they're just getting very slowly worse and worse and worse. And when people tend to extend that out to three or four months, maybe even further, is that the, the ability to be able to dig out that hole is excessively larger than you think it should be. So no longer can you dig yourself a big hole for overtraining for four months and go, ah, oh, I'll take a week, two weeks off completely. I've really, really broken. My coach has told me this or my friends have told me that I'm just done way too much. Two weeks off, I'm good. No, that's not the case. In these cases, it can be a month. It can be two months sometimes if you really dig yourself a big hole. So I think that's an important factor to recognize in that. And then the other is that you get this phenomenon when you do training and you're asking your body to be in peak performance is that effectively you have to push the body a little too far. So you will be overreaching and you'll be adapting and you'll be operating in this kind of eight out of 10, nine out of 10 capacity. But when you pull back the volume or the, or the loading of your training is that this kind of acts like a tapering cycle in performance where you're then able to reach your true potential, you're fully rested, you're fully prepared for maximum levels. But in terms of the signaling that you're giving your body, you're actually in a zone which would allow you to detrain. So these windows where you totally go off the gas and allow yourself to get to 10 out of 10 are actually also a signal or an environment under which the body will quite quickly detrain and lose its maximum potential. So it's this really interesting two sides of the coin of how do you play it, how long do you want your peak for, and how you progress as a climber. If, if that, hopefully that explains the concept. Yeah, it's, it's, there's some fine tuning there, it sounds like, you know, to really, if you really want to be able to do it right, it sounds like you really have to understand how your body reacts to rest, how your body reacts to um, some strain or some overreach, and then, you can you can kind of dial that in but you also touched on this concept of essentially programming some rest maybe it's a deload week or maybe it's a few days before you're trying to perform maybe you're going on a trip like i've got coming up here for example is there a general rule of thumb that you and the coaches um, will offer up to clients um, as as a way to program rest for those of us who have a hard time programming rest so I think there are some rules of thumb um, and there's, there's really two parts of the equation, I think. One is to try and always respect a degree of intuition in any athlete, but it's to a degree because I will say some athletes 
are very intuitively correct about their assumptions of rest. Others are intuitively wrong. Right. So you can learn that about either yourself or your athlete that you're working with. So that's that's one part. Intuition is always got a, a high value in this situation. And then the second is by planning in rest, it enables you to create discipline, habit, and structure into essentially respecting the basic rules of training and the basic physiology of what's going on if you are indeed putting in hard work in terms of these training cycles. And I would say most climbers out there will do very well on what we would call a three to one work rest ratio. So this is three works, three weeks of loaded climbing work. So hard, hard climbing for three weeks and then one week of deload. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about the kind of structure of those two. So that's for the majority that I would say they would operate quite well on that. Another scenario where we might change that up or two more co very common scenarios is when someone's first starting to train and they've never done structured training before, especially if they haven't done it in another sport, we may well suggest doing a two to one work rest ratio. So two weeks of work, one week of deload afterwards. And the same again for our slightly older athletes, that tends to kick in around 45 or so onwards, um, especially 50, especially in the 60s, and up that even more if you add in a lot of work stress or life stress, and then that, I think that's very important to add in there. Um, the other scenario that you may well use for some very elite athletes is working on a five to two work rest ratio, so a much longer mesocycle but a more extensive deload cycle over two weeks. But again, it depends on the athlete and how long you've worked with them for. The bit that I would like everyone to grasp when I talk about work weeks and rest weeks is that work weeks do not all have to be the same. Week one, two, and three don't look, need to look the same. You can slowly load and ramp things up through those three weeks. That's a perfectly adequate and sensible and intelligent thing to do with that work um, cycle. And then on the deload, we're not talking total rest. You don't just sit on the couch for a week and do nothing or do some stretching all week long. Deload will typically be classed as something around 40 to 60% reduction in load or volume across that week. Most of the stuff that we do with athletes at Lattice is reduce more heavily on the volume aspect of their training rather than the intensity aspects of the training. And the reason why we do that is that we've learned with climbers over the years is that if you drop off too much intensity work, they tend to have a really poor onboarding of the next part of the mesocycle. They, they come out their deload where you can go, oh, I feel really rubbish. I'm not pulling hard. I just don't feel like I've got anything in my fingers. I'm gonna to have to take a whole week to get back into it now. So we maintain the high quality work, but just really short and intensive during that deload week. So that's the sort of rough guidelines, how you do that.